we continue in uh, we're trying to figure out what does it really mean to grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Do you have an outline? Do you need one? If you need one, raise your hand. Because uh, you, you really do need one if you don't have one. But uh, if we're alive in Christ, the uh, one of the characteristics of life is growth. Okay, things that are alive usually grow. I grow older in, in other ways too, and uh, we should be maturing and growing to be more like Jesus Christ each and every day. And as our our lives are abandoned to His glory, to His causes to his honor, to his praise, we then progress along that line of growth. If we are doing those things, you, you cannot not grow. Okay? Uh, so if, if it's true that glorifying God is the way that we grow, then it, it's absolutely essential, and I've already said this about 20 times in these lessons, it's essential that we, we we know what it means to glorify God. And glorifying God is not a foggy concept that's taught in seminaries. It's not a vague, mystical thought. Glorifying God is very practical, very concrete in its truth. Okay? We've been talking a lot lately about the truth. In fact, uh, so we've already shared three keys to spiritual growth. Are they in your outline? Yes. Oh, too bad. I was going to quit. I was going to quit you. <laughs> Number one is that we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. <clears throat> Number two is we glorify Him by aiming our life at that purpose of glorifying God. The best verse. The best verse for. Uh, Number one is Philippians 2. Just read that short chapter. The uh, best one for the second one is 1 Corinthians 10.31. And then the last one is that we glorify God, remember, by confessing our sins. The good one for that is Joshua 7.19, where it says, uh, Give glory unto the God of Israel, make confessions of your sin. So I want to just restate those with those verses. And we had just begun looking at a fourth principle when we finished last week. And uh, as we continue examining our faith, uh, the next thing we do to glorify God, which increases our faith, which is the faith we should have, is that we trust Him. Okay? We trust God. Uh, and that's a, that's a pretty basic thing, correct? Uh, and it is. It's a basic thing, but it's essential for us to realize uh, that glorifying God by trusting Him is essential. It's simple. By that I mean, you know, don't get carried away with uh, uh, the uh, complexities of religion, because the complexities of religion are not about glorifying God. The complexities of religion are things that men do to attempt to explain what God is and how we glorify God and everything like that. In your own mind, when I say trust, what do you what do you what do you think of? What does it mean to you to trust? Give me some words. Totally. Huh? Totally. Do you believe? What else? Obey. Obey. Hey, that's what I like that. Yes. Right. Amen. What else? Anybody? Faith. Believe. Obey. What? Faith, amen. Okay. So, uh, look at Romans 4. Romans 4. Uh, we'll show an illustration. We're going to look at an illustration. I like to teach by illustration. Uh, when I was growing up to be a teacher, which I never really was. Uh, they taught us to teach by il illustration. And Romans 4 deals, uh, there's a lot, a lot, have you ever noticed there's a large portion of the Word of God that deals with Abraham? You know, he's way, he's way back there, and there's a lot about him there, and then he ends up over here in the New Testament. So he's pretty important for us to, 
to look at. And uh, Paul the Apostle is speaking here about Abraham and Abraham's relationship to faith. And how was Abraham, was Abraham saved by the law? What was he saved by? By faith. By faith. Uh, and that's the way it is with any man in any age. We are saved by faith. And in verse 19, regarding Abraham in 419 in Romans, it says, uh, and not being, okay, so here's a description of Abraham, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about 100 years old, in the deadness of Sarah's womb. So that tells us something about the man Abraham. Abraham, that tells us about his circumstances. Abraham and Sarah never had children, correct? And they never had children because evidently Sarah's womb was dead. She could not produce. And by this time in their life, by the time Abraham is, uh, at this time he's 100 years old, she's considered by most people to be about four years younger. She's 96 or so. And they've never been able to have a child. And God comes to them and he says, you're going to have a child. And you know, you, you guys know the story as well as I do, that at first, Abraham had, had issues believing, right? And Sarah had issues believing. Uh, but after a while, he became confident of God's word, and he did no longer disbelieve. He began to believe that a 100-year-old man and a 96-year-old woman who had a dead womb could have a kid. Okay? He ended up believing that because we see that by the first words in the 19th verse. And not being weak in faith. He got to a point where he believed what God told him. And, uh, and, then, and then look at verse 20. And he did not, what does your Bible say? Waver. Waver. Stagger. Stagger. I kind of like stagger. And he did not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith. And when he was strengthened in his faith, what happened? He glorified God. See, when you get stronger in your faith, you glorify God. So every time you make a faith enhancement in your life, you glorify God. And uh, very, very, it's not, it's not, it's not rocket science. Uh, God, Abraham glorified God by believing. That's what, it, that's what it says. He just believed, and in that belief, uh, he glorified God to a greater, greater degree. And you're all familiar. What does Isaac mean? Yeah. Laughter. You know why? I, you know, I've read a lot of things about why they call him laughter. Sarah. 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 Huh? Sarah. 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 Yeah, I think they used to sit around and joke about it. If you're 96 years old, you're going to have a kid. Like, sure, sure. We've never had a kid. Oh, yeah. Don't no worry. We're going to have a kid. When they were, that's, I think they just sat around and laughed about it before they actually believed it. So when it actually happened, they called them, they called them laughing. There's no, there's, there's no theological reason for me to believe in that. But Abraham is, we, what we see here is Abraham believing in God. He gives God glory because he's believing in God. And what it's saying, it says God... Listen, if you say it, if God says it, we should believe it. And what that says then is that uh, is if, if God says it, we should believe it. And what that means is that, God, I trust you. I'm not going to trust me for this. I'm going to trust you for this. And when you trust God, that's when you give Him glory. And when God says something and you don't believe him, this is the one that Betsy didn't like, you drag him down. And you're saying, God, I know, I know, you've got a good thought on this thing. Kind of like what I talked to my son about today. You know, I really appreciate the offer you're giving me, God, and the thought you're giving me, but I don't know. Uh, are you sure, God, you understand my circumstances? Are you sure? 
that you know what's best for me today? And see, whenever we question God, Philippians 4.19, what is Philippians 4.19? If you read Philippians 4.19 and then raise your hands if you believe. Some of you know that verse. Okay. If you believe it. You know, that's a wonderful truth. God can supply all your needs. Now, who gets to define what your needs are? God. <laughs> God does. Uh, and, uh, but you know, and I talk to people about that, you know. The truth, I talk to myself about that. The problem is, is when we get in difficult situations, when we get in dire straits, when we begin to panic, people begin to wonder whether God can really do it. And when they start that, then they begin to question God. And then when you begin, as a, especially as a believer, when you, in a believer's life, when you begin to question God, you know what happens to you? I, I, call, it, I call it suffering trauma. When you have the Holy Spirit within you, but in your mind you start believing, you, you have trouble believing what God guarantees you is true. You, you have a, a trauma in your life. What is a trauma? What's the definition of a trauma in, in the medical world? It's a severe uh, accident or a severe injury. That's what happens it's to okay, a believer no. when they start to fail, when they begin to question God. Jeez, God. And see, what happens then? Okay, so here you are. Do your friends know you're a Christian? Okay. So you're a Christian, and God will provide all your needs. And then, all of a sudden, you find yourself in difficult circumstances, and you start relying on other things for your needs. What does that say to your friends? I'm saying your God is weak. Your God's not strong enough to actually help you. You don't really believe in your God. Uh, you know, listen to me. In regards to this verse, you either believe it or you don't. You can't have middle ground. You either, you either say that that phrase is true in your life or it's not. And then, and then, you, go, and then you live your life according to that belief. But you can't have it both ways. You can't believe them part of the time and not believe them the rest of the time. Because when you do that, what you're really doing is doubting. And doubting God is to say, when you doubt God, what you really say is that uh, he's not living up to his reputation. Look at 1 John 5.10. What does 1 John 5.10 say? Do you, know, do you really understand what 1 John 5.10 says? Somebody read 1 John 5.10. So if you don't believe God, what does that mean? I mean, you made God a liar. Can I paraphrase that? Is that a correct paraphrase? Am I perverting that word? No. If you don't believe God, then you make him into a liar. Okay? Who's, who's first John written to? Written to believers. Hey, believer. If you don't believe God, what does that mean? 98%? 99%? No, it means 100%. If you don't believe God, you make him a liar. He's a liar in your life. Then we wonder why we have difficulties. Why God's not glorified to the extent he he should be. You see, disbelieving God, uh, let me give you another, another illustration. The Bible said, listen, the Bible says you're supposed to give your money to the Lord. How? How should you give your money? Here's a word. Chris, I love all those words you're saying. Joy. Joy. But here's the one word you, you hardly ever hear a Christian say. You're supposed to give your money sacrificially. When's the last time you, you heard somebody teach that from the pulpit? You know why? Because they're afraid everybody will run for the hills. <laughs> sacrificially. What does that mean? 
You're supposed to give abundantly. What you give to the Lord is supposed to place you in a position of sacrifice. When you give out of your abundance, it's when you give when it hurts that it really matters to you. I'm sorry, but that's the way most people are. What It says don't let the right hand, let, let the left hand know what you're doing, doesn't it? You know what that means? It means you give without regard for what you need. You give because it's God's anyway. You don't have to. You don't, he already got all, this, all, the, all the cattle and all the hills. Just give it to him. You give... When you give, what does God give, do in, in return? He gives right back to you, doesn't he? If not monetarily, he gives to you in a different way. But, you know, you can teach that principle. Do you, do you know what percentage of people actually tithe, T-I-T-H-E, in the American church today? Under 30. Under 30% 30 of the people in the church, I, I have no idea who, what people give in this church, I don't want to know. I don't think I should know. But under 30% of people, we're not talking sacrificial. We're talking tithe. I think Renee probably knows what the percentage is here. This is a very giving church. Yes, Mom? Yeah, I went to uh, a church in Rosa, and I was over there. And I mean, they had like three or four services, and it was packed. A modern, beautiful church, four services every Sunday morning, and they're operating in the red. Why? Well, just it, think what the people are missing out on. Because if you yeah, you're right. So, you know, listen, when you believe God, it changes the way you act. Belief is transformation. If you, have, if you hang on to the things that you brought into your Christian life after your salvation, that's not transformation. That's transference. You just transfer your old beliefs into your new life. Transformation is a change. It's like, and, and forgive me, you know, some people are so distraught over death. Why? What does the Word say about death? I know people that are more anxious about dying than, than anything else in their life. I've counseled with people like that. And I, I, and I, and I understand that, 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 that there might be a reason for some anxiety, but isn't the anticipation of the ultimate end greater? Shouldn't it be? Shouldn't it be? God provides all our needs. You know what? Even to the point of death. He provides all your needs. Even to the point of death. He's going to take care of you. It won't, it won't, it won't, it won't. So, but when you run, and I'll, and I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll fess up. Most of us, me included, really, honestly, have to face the fact that in this particular area of trusting God, we're a little bit thin in our beliefs sometimes. That 20th birth verse back in John 4 where it says, Abraham staggered not at the promise of God. God, Abraham got to a point in his life where he decided, I'm going to glorify God no matter what. God said, walk this way, Abraham. Abraham walked that way. God said, uh, take Isaac and uh, take him up on that hill, even though he's the, the son of your loins, even though I've made a promise to you that your descendants will be like the sand of the seas and the stars of the heaven. Take him up on that hill and kill him. In essence, what God told him to do. And what did Abraham do? He took a Isaac out there, he strapped, strapped a, a bundle of sticks on, the, on his back and they went up on that mountain. He laid him down on that altar of wood, tied him to it, and he took his knife and he was ready to plunge it into his heart. Never flinched, never questioned. And then he heard a ram in the thicket and he heard a voice.
boy staying his hand. God had provided a way out. God didn't have to, but he did. The point of that story is Abraham was willing to go all the way. Are you willing to go all the way? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> I made a joke about Flagstaff and was worried about going up there. And I was showing no faith before. Well, I took it as a joke. Uh, but I'm talking about worried about going to 7,000 feet. The joke was a joke. Uh, God gave you a sense of humor, so, you know. But, but worrying about my health at 7,000 feet and my oxygen situation, I was seriously worried about going up there. And I realized I was not showing faith in the Lord. And I apologize for that. Amen. Worry is not really a word that should be appropriate to the Christian vocabulary. Yes, Larry. Getting back to what Jim just said, isn't that kind of like, you know, medication or going to the doctor? I mean, use wisdom. And obviously 7,000 feet probably isn't good for your health. So, you know, if the doctor tells you you better stay in bed, you know, because you've got this or that, then you ought to stay in bed and not say, well, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm a man of faith, I'm going to get up and do what I want. Yeah. Right? Amen. Amen. You know, what would have happened if Abraham had slayed Isaac? You would have raised him. Would have brought him back. Yeah. And I don't think uh, Abraham uh, had had any personal knowledge of anyone ever being brought back from the dead. But I believe that he fought that way. Yes, Arlene? Well, I did not Abraham until Isaac come to Antichrist, what's going to happen? 
will be eliminated. At least most, most uh, believers will be. Uh, some will still survive. But uh, they don't want to acquiesce to the rules of Nebuchadnezzar. And they, uh, they're not going to worship his image. They only want to worship the true God. And so he brings them in and he says in verse 14, it says, uh, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not serve my gods, nor worship the golden Im image which I have set up? Is it true that you won't cooperate with the religious system present in the country? Uh, and then it talks about the, the music. When the music plays, you're to worship the image that I have made. If you don't worship it, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Now listen. This is a bad situation. This guy that's talking to these three young men is the most powerful man in the world. And he says, if you don't bow down and, 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 and worship me, I'm going to throw you in a fiery furnace. And you know what they're thinking? If we don't bow down and worship this guy, he's going to throw us in a fiery furnace. Yeah. They have no doubt. He's not threatening. He's telling them the truth. And uh, so consider our circumstances here tonight. Our circumstances aren't very tough, but they're, they're a pretty tough place here. And, you know... Uh, 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 Nebuchadnezzar immediately puts their faith to the test. Do they, do, the question in their mind has to be, okay, can our God handle Nebuchadnezzar? That's what they have to be thinking. Is our God greater than what we, than what we see? See, oftentimes we want to, we're like, a, we're like the scribes and the Pharisees in, in the Gospel of John. I can't wait to start teaching the Gospel of John. I'll be there in about two years. <laughs> but they always wanted a sign. I can't wait to teach the seven I am's in the Gospel of John. Man, I'm already excited about it. It's two years away, probably. But, see, their, their, their dilemma is, do we trust what we see, the most powerful man on earth, with a big old hot, hot fiery furnace, or do we trust our faith? What do you trust today? What you see or what's in your heart? You know, uh, can God handle Nebuchadnezzar? They can see Nebuchadnezzar. Can they see God? No. Sure can't. They know about God's host of angels. Can they see him? No, but they can see Nebuchadnezzar's army. He's the most powerful man on the face of the earth. Uh, they can see the power of Nebuchadnezzar right before them. They understand his punitive power. It's right there in front of them. And then in verse 16, they answer him. And what do they say? Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we're not concerned to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. We know God can deliver us from the fiery furnace. Deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. See, the witness is great in either occurrence. If they walk willfully into the furnace and glorify God, they're glorifying God by their trust. That's ultimate trust. That's the trust of the martyrs. That's how you've got these guys that you read, if you ever read Fox's book of the martyrs, that are tied to these stakes, and as they're burning, they're singing. They're praising God. That's how that happens. So here we have these guys. These guys, either way, if God delivers us, great. If not, we're willing to accept the outcome. Even if he doesn't come, we're still not going to worship you. Because we're, why? They're already delivered. You're already delivered. You don't need anything else. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, as you sit here tonight, you are delivered. You don't need anything else. What else do you want? 
what else can he do for you? One way or another, if not out of the fire, he's going to deliver them to his righteous kingdom where they'll be with him. Because, you know, they understand that when you're true to God, God is true to you. So what happens? Well, Nebuchadnezzar's not used to hearing the word no, is he? So he gets mad. And what does verse 19 say? You know what the you know what the the, the real translation is? It says that his visage changed. V i s a g e. Does anybody have that? You know what that means? I mean, you're afraid at all. He got so mad. It changed the, the picture of his face. That's how mad he was. He was mad. Because Nebuchadnezzar was not used to somebody saying no to him. So these guys tell him no. And he spoke and he commanded the heat to furnace up, what, seven times greater? So they pump the fire up until it's seven times higher than normal. And of course, these guys are moving them over to the furnace door and they've got to be shaking in their boots. I used to work at uh, Duval Mine. And whenever you went to work at Deval Mine, they did you two favors. They put you on the night shift, and they put you in the Millennium plant. And Millennium is a byproduct in the uh, smelting of copper, and it's a black powder that's added to metal that makes it harder. And what they do is they have these huge roasters, and at the top, they have a little conveyor belt that drops this Millennium powder into these roasters. And they've got these huge arms that sweep it towards the middle, and then it falls into another level. And the big arm, and it's got like six levels. And when it gets out of that, it's refined to the point that it's ready to be added to metal. Well, the problem is, is when the stuff falls, it, it's, some of it falls on top of these huge arms. And if too much of it falls onto these huge arms as it's being refined, the arms get too heavy and they quit functioning. So you, they have, on each level of this roaster, they have these big steel doors. And you open these doors and you have this long steel pole. I mean, it's a long old steel pole, heavy man. And you scrape the top of these arms and get all that powder off of there. Well, the first thing they teach you is when you open that door, make sure you're standing behind it. Because if you open that door like this and you look like that, <laughs> you get there might be a time that you'll get fried. Okay. So here come these guys. They're, they're taking Meshach, Shadrach, and a baby go up there. And, and they, they take them up to the door and what happens to them? They're incinerated. They're turned into ashes. Before these three guys all walk in there, there's already a miracle transpiring. See, with God and our faith in God, there are no impossibilities in our life. There's really nothing that's impossible. You, uh, you know, if, uh, I do marriage counseling upon occasion, and uh, I'll have a spouse come in and tell me, I, I just can't. I can't do it anymore. We're not, the great word, the great word that we have in our society today is we are incompatible. Right. So I was asking, well, are you a Christian? Yeah. Is your spouse a Christian? Hopefully they say, yeah. I said, well, tell me how that works. How can two Christians who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit be incompatible? All you got to do is get your life in the right direction. That's all you got to do. The most, the wisest words I ever heard in in marriage counseling was when I was being counseled. And a man told me, you want to do it your way or you want to do it God's way? And that was after I was saved. And you know what? He knew exactly what he was talking about. So we did it God's way. And it works when you do it God's way. It's like the lady who comes to see her pastor and she says, my husband rubs me the wrong way. Just tell her, turn around. <laughs> and rubbing you the right way. <laughs> you know, the, the problem we have, you know, when you have interpersonal uh, problems with anybody of the faith, a spouse or a friend, it's because somebody's going the wrong way. That's the only way there can be a problem. 
Somebody has to be going the wrong way. So all you got to do is take your issues to the Word of God. You know, I make people write your issues down, and then we examine each one. What does God's Word say about that? And then, then you can come up with a plan on how to defeat those things. But uh, the simplest thing that you have to do in those situations is you just have to believe God. Well, and that's a believed person. She's got to believe everywhere. In her front yard, she's been in my office, and everywhere she goes, she's got to believe. You know, I've got time. What's, and when I think, in my own mind, what's the greatest challenge to faith in the history of humanity? You know who I think of? The greatest challenge of faith in the history of humanity, I always think of Noah. Oh, yeah. Noah. Noah. God said to Noah, build a boat. You know where Noah lived? What's a boat? In the middle of the desert. Yeah. Build a boat. There wasn't any water around. I do not know if there was any, any real bodies of water around. And God told them, build a boat. How conceivable is that? I don't know. Big boat. Yeah, I'm going to get there. How conceivable is that to Moab? Build a boat. Build a boat. What's that? You know how big that boat is? To give you an illustration about the size of the Queen Mary. Build a boat in the desert where there ain't no water that's as big as the Queen Mary. Must have had a big backyard. Building a boat that big. You know. Uh, and you know, how did, yeah, Mike. I just read about that. I mean, just recently, the Ark was the biggest boat built until the Queen Mary was built. There you go. Amen. I didn't know that, but amen. And how's he supposed to build the boat? Go down to Ace? <laughs> Buy some lumber? A boat as big as the Queen Mary. And you've got to go down and chop down the trees mm -hmm. and make the planks and build it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How old was he when he started? He wasn't, he wasn't real old because he took him a long time. So, and not only that, okay, build a boat. There ain't no water. Uh, as big as the Queen Mary, you do all the work yourself. And you get to do it in the middle of a pagan society who, who derides you every day. How many righteous people were there in the world? Outside of his family, there was nobody. How many did God spare? Nobody. And then people can't believe that God's going to allow the tribulation to happen. Get serious. He's already done it once. He's already had a dress rehearsal. He knows exactly what he's going to do. So he's in the middle of this baby, <clears throat> pagan society. God says, go build a ship, go build a boat. And he begins, and how long does it take him? You got that much faith? To build a boat for 120 years? You know, I can, okay. I can see me starting. If I, if I got a young lumber yard. You know, I'll go by the wood. I, I like to hammer nails. You know, it makes me feel good. The smell of sawdust in my nostrils from most testosterone in, in my body or something. I like that eye, whole idea. But after a couple days, you know, how about after a week or two weeks? How about after a year? And why is he going to build the boat? Because it's going to rain. What is rain? <laughs> Nobody's ever seen rain. And he's supposed to be building this huge boat because it's going to rain. You know, we might be willing to do it because we know what rain is. But Noah didn't know anything. Nobody knew anything about rain. It had never rained up to this time. Uh, and shipbuilders in those in the old days that were built with the holes had to the knowledge of the fact that when you build a boat with dry wood, 
after you submerge it in water, yeah, it's it's open. Open. so the wood expands and it seals it off, both leaks. Yeah. So having no intimate knowledge of boats or handle building boats, but of course you can use YouTube. But you know what the Bible says about Noah? It says that Noah was a man of great faith. And he was. Built a boat 120 years out in the desert. Hebrews 11, 7. It says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen. What's that? Rain. God told him it's going to rain. It had not yet been seen. He moved with a sense of awe, awe, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. faith. I, I say, I want to meet Noah. I want to shake his hand and say, hey, you are an example of faith. That's faith. 120 years. Don't even know. Never seen rain building the Queen Mary in the backyard. Man, and everybody's walking by. Hey, look at that yeah, stupid guy. Favorite. He's been out there. After 30 years, people have to think he's a lunatic. <laughs> after 60 years, they have to think he's far from random mad. He's very And he's got another 60 years. <laughs> you know, I hate it. I used to hate it when people made fun of me, man. I'd slap you upside the head. You'd be fun of me. <laughs> and, they, and you know, all these Vegas are walking by saying, look at that stupid guy. But in your own life, so that's a great example for us. Do we believe? Do we believe to that degree? Do we live our life in that state of faith in God? Once again, the Bible says that we walk not by sight, but by faith. And that's that whole, that whole idea is that we walk by faith, and when you walk. You move, correct? And that's a picture of our maturing. We don't stand by faith. We walk by faith. We move along. And in that moving along, we get closer to God's perfect likeness. I believe by, uh, after 120 years, when Noah hung that door on the ark, he had to be thinking, man, am I glad. But I bet you he looked a lot like he was, I bet you he was close to being glorified. And he still had a long life ahead. He, and he still, uh, and realistically, he still made mistakes too later in his life. But all of that faith, all of those years, that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be spiritually progressing step by step by faith, not by what we see. Because when you try to see where you're going, when you try to analyze everything, that's how you get yourself into trouble. Yeah. You just got to step out. Uh, you know, and I, I, I don't speak of myself as an example to glorify me. I speak of myself as an example to glorify God. But when we felt God, when I felt, when I looked in the mirror one Sunday morning, and it was like, it's time. And all I could do was weep and tell, and tell my wife, God says it's time. It's time to do what he told me to do. All those years ago, in 1992, over 20 years, it's time. What did we do? We just stepped out on faith. What happens if, if nobody comes? You better find another job. Because I'll be very real, I'll be very honest with you. I don't make enough, we don't make enough to live off our military retirement checks. We have to work. Better find another job. If what you're doing, if you've got it wrong, you better you better figure out something else to do because it isn't. It, you're not going to be able to do this very long. First Baptist was very generous. They gave me, I think, six weeks severance pay. I knew I had enough to pay my bills for six weeks, and I I did have some money saved. You know what? Not as much as I have saved now. <laughs> See how God works. Not as much as I have saved now. But hey, and that's what I mean by stepping out in faith. See, I don't, and that's what my dilemma is with the people of the church, because I don't know any other life. 
My life has always been stepping out in faith. And I don't know any other life. And I want everybody to experience it, to experience the same faith that I experience. Maybe I, maybe I don't understand the level of faith that you experience. But I, I understand the oppression that I see in, in Christians' lives. And it slays me when I see Christians being oppressed. And I don't want you to be oppressed. I want you to have a victorious life that's founded and grounded in your faith in Christ. You know, you know, I said when you analyze stuff, you get yourself in trouble. What happens when the Israelites approach the promised land? What do they do? They sent in spies. You know what the spies did? There were two groups. There was one group of ten. You know what they did? They went in and analyzed. You know what they said when they got back? They're like grasshoppers. There's so many of them. They're like the locust of the field. And you know what else? There's giants. And what did the other two guys say? God will deliver us. Let's go get them. That's the faith we need. God's with us. Let's go get them. God's with us. Let's go get them. You know, if God, I, I, God, listen to me. God is with us at New Life Family Worship Center. He really is. When you think of what God's done in the time and what He's done, God is with us. Let's go get Him. Okay? God is with us. Let's go deliver people from the horrors of hell. God is with us. Let's be a witness in the community. Okay? Okay. I'll stop there. Yeah, you know, I was going to say something too when you said. I mean, God always provides, you know. When you start working at the school and you sit down and talk and you say, well, we're not going to have a vacation and all this other stuff, you know, like we used to every year. And I said, well, we're okay with that. Well, one year he provided a cruise and the other year he provided a trip to Europe. Remember that? Oh, yeah. And it's just amazing how he got it. And I'll tell you what, my wife has always exhibited greater faith in her life than I have in mine. God has spoken to me more dramatically. But she's always been the engineer of our faith. Because she completes me. And women all, oftentimes are much more spiritually adept than men. That's why it's good for men to listen to their wives. Especially in spiritual matters. But... And I, how many times have I heard my wife say that of those words? God will provide. And he always can. So, let's see.